Hello everyone, welcome back to Dragonfly Engineering. So this is part two of the new injection molding machine setup. And this machine is a Iapetus two-shot injection molding machine made by HITN. And it's a 250 ton machine with two injection units and a rotary table. Its main purpose, or one of its main purposes, would be to over mold a second plastic onto a first plastic, either two colors or like a rubber outer coating on top of a hard plastic base. So this week we're going to finish up the electrical connections, the cooling water connections, set up some of the uh, plastic drying infrastructure, and the technician for HITN actually came out and commissioned the machine. I didn't get much footage of that because mostly we were just too busy with hanging the molds and uh, just starting up the machine and, and going through all of the kind of the startup frenzy of work. So hope you enjoy. All right, so this is another new and key piece of equipment, uh, which I purchased on McMaster Car. It is a electric chain hoist, and I've, I've actually had it for a few weeks now, and I haven't had a chance to open it, mostly because this thing came. And the other hoist that I have in the other room for the 90-ton machine was an import that I got on Amazon, and it's starting to show uh, the amount of money that I paid for it is, <laughs> is such that it's falling apart, basically. <laughs> when I first turned on the, the import from Amazon, the cooling fan exploded because it was an injection molded fan in a housing and the whole thing just blew apart because it had an interference when it shipped. And then uh, recently, when I hit the button up and down, sometimes when I release the button, the, the winch keeps going, uh, which is not a good thing. And then the other day, the winch just started losing power and the mold started to slowly unwind to the floor. So I basically need to get rid of it. So due to those lessons, I went ahead and bought something off McMaster. And this is a chain hoist that's made in the USA and costs maybe um, 20 times more than the cable winch that I bought on Amazon. So let's see what we got. Right, here it is. Check out the control. Oh yeah, that looks good. Definitely feels like better buttons. And this is the chain bag, I believe. So I'll have to probably read some instructions on exactly how this works. The steel block that's clamped onto the end of the chain is what stops the the hoist from just driving its chain out of its out of its gear drive. So that's important. And this just basically hangs in this container. Okay, and then we just Yeah, and that's it. And then the end of our chain drops into our bucket. Yeah, nice and compact. There we go. Okay, well let's hang this on our gantry crane and see how it looks. Now we're gonna hook in. Hopefully it fits. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't want a safety clasp though. That may be an issue. I may have to get a, a chain link or something. Yeah, the little spring clip didn't go past the the end of this thing yeah, okay usual warnings all right let's see what happens yeah there it goes and this is an adjustable speed one too so the harder i push down on the button the faster the hook goes which is nice all right so this is pretty precise and very nice to see I can really just slowly lift this hook up or go faster and it, and it accelerates. So it's got like a little computer in there. If I hit just, if I 
barely touch down, then I get the very slow control down. And then if I give it full force, it'll accelerate and go faster until I tell it to stop. So now we're gonna go faster and faster and faster. And then, wow, it stops instantly. Yeah, it'll definitely pick up. Well, I have to say I like it. I have to see who the manufacturer is. It says CM on the thing, but McMaster car sells, usually anything you get on McMaster car is going to be production quality, uh, but you do, sometimes you do pay for it though. <laughs> but ultimately, if you get a, a good tool like this, you'll save yourself over the next several years and just the aggravation and the delays in projects. So I found the, the documents for that chain hoist. It's a uh, company, Columbus McKinnon, and the hoist is called the, the CM Shopstar VS, and I guess VS probably stands for variable speed. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, they're not sponsored or anything. I just picked this on McMaster car, and this is these are the folks who made it. All right, so we're getting pretty close to the end here. Uh, this is the final run of conduit that I just bent. So this box is called an LB, and I don't know what that stands for, maybe low profile box. But anyway, you use these, or I use these at the end of a conduit run. It goes basically right here, and the wires go into this, into this um, threaded adapter from a EMT to a threaded conduit. Uh, the wires go into this guy, and then you take this cover off, and it allows you to pull wire up and out this cover with less of a bend so you can kind of pull all your wire through and then you loop the wire around and then you send it up into your final cabinet which would be something like this. This is a plastic bushing and uh, which basically goes screws in like this and, and that this plastic bushing, this yellow plastic helps protect the wires from getting abraded from the metal and then on the other end, you can get these threaded plastic caps, which I need to go around and get, so I'll be right back. All right, well, I couldn't find any one inch plastic protective screw on caps, but here's a one and a half inch one. So I'm gonna to have to go back to the hardware store and buy the little plastic thing that screws on. And that protects the, the wire jacket insulation from getting abraded on metal. I usually like to use these plastic uh, protective rings as much as possible to protect this, 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 what could be a sharp metal edge. Basically what you do is you stick, so this washer has like a, has a, a flange on it, or a pressed in flange, and that allows the, uh, the flange to basically lock within the inner circle of the uh, cabinet, which is oversized for our one inch L LB box. LB, yeah. So you put the flange up against the screw crown nut, which is adjustable in height, like that. And then you put the LB box through. This washer actually isn't quite right, to, quite the right size. But the idea is that the second flange locks the two washers into that hole, and then you can lock down the top with your second nut. and making sure you've got enough room for your, your safety plastic cap that I need to buy. Anyhow, so this is, this is how you can adapt a hole with these stepped washers. And then when you tighten these down, and the best way to tighten these down is you get a screwdriver and you whack the little tangs to lock the this nut in place. But there we are, once I tighten it, again I don't have a screwdriver with me, I am lacking in equipment. <laughs> but you can imagine, you tighten this thing, this nut down, and then that, that step in the flange washer uh, prevents it from moving. So in fact I'm tugging on it pretty good and I can't move it in any direction. So that may actually be just fine. So now that box will connect our conduit here up through the box with the wires that poke up through 
at a basically a tight 90 degree. You can't really use these while you're running wire through long runs of conduit. You, you really need the long radius so that the wire doesn't jam up. But at the end of your conduit run, you can use these LBs that basically will bend the wire at a, a sharp 90 degree and then bring it up into your cabinet to hook up. And that's about it. And I'm going to set up a second one back here with this knockout. And same thing, because again, we've got two circuits, uh, about 50 amps each at 480 volts. So because we're at 480 volts, we can use a, a lower gauge wire like this. Anyway, so let's finish this off. <laughs> Okay, we are officially done with conduit. So this is the input of the two power lines to the molding machine control cabinet. Now the next step is to actually wire in a second circuit breaker such that when the cabinet is opened, the power is shut off for both the heater circuit as well as the motor circuit. So let me zoom out and we can talk about that a little more. All right, so this is the panel main power shutoff for the molding machine, which is basically a large circuit breaker uh, where the power input from one of these two lines and the coil will connect to the inputs on the breaker. Now with usually with equipment like this, there is a safety feature on the door. All right, so this circuit breaker, which is the main power shutoff for the entire machine, so that on a daily basis, you would turn the machine off by flipping this breaker. But this breaker is connected with this rod which pokes through the front door of the service cabinet or the power control cabinet so that you can turn the machine on and off with this with this handle that bolts on to the outside now the idea with this with this kind of switch here is that for technician safety this switch ensures in normal operation that you turn the power off to the cabinet and then after you wait a few minutes you can then open the cabinet and know that you're safely working on the insides without the 480 volts uh, three-phase power randomly churning about in here and maybe shocking you so it's 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 basically a safety mechanism in our case we have two power inputs one for the motors and one for the heaters uh, but only one circuit breaker switch and you can't really rely on trying to match phases and and uh, break the power from two different uh, panels in your machine itself so what we have to do is add a second circuit breaker for the second power input also with a second door switch that pokes through the outside and effectively uh, results in the machine needing two switches to turn off before we can um, open the cabinet. This is the circuit breaker. It's rated for 680 volts 
and 50 amps and you can see on the switch here that it's 50 amps so that's on and then off and then this gizmo this kind of door switch extension is uh, basically just bolts on to the front of this circuit breaker like so and then all of this bolts to the panel and then we have to cut a hole in the door for the hand switch to access this this cam connection uh, to shut this breaker off from the outside so that's that's the idea and, and most equipment has some setup like this so this circuit breaker is nice because if it overcurrents it'll switch off the machine you know it's a regular breaker like in your house uh, and it's also the power switch and safety door interlock for making sure that everything's safe inside by not allowing this door to open unless the switch is switched off. Now there is like a service person's um, kind of override, but you have to physically do some other thing to the switch to basically allow a service person to work in here with power on. And that person would know that the power is on because they had to do a special uh, bypass on the switch to allow the door to open. So anyway, that's, that's the deal. So this is sticky plastic used to, like to clean your feet off when you go into a clean room. And I'm going to stick some of this underneath here to catch the shavings from drilling so that I don't have something that's going to short out something later on. So it's, it's mildly sticky. Hopefully my handiwork lines up. Oh, I should mount it right side up though. Because basically a circuit breaker has got a big magnetic coil. And if too much current's going through the magnetic coil, then the magnetic force will pull the circuit open and it's got like a toggling, collapsing type of mechanism. That one seems to be going. Sometimes you can sharpen the end of your screw if you're, if you want to guide the screw in to a hole that's not exactly lined up. Okay, that's tight and we'll tighten this one now. Okay, on the stamped sheet metal here, it says off and this is on. So you can see when I when I twist this knob, which is, has a cam key for an outside uh, door switch, we flip it on. That's cool. And this, this slippery plastic, probably acetyl or Delrin molded keyway, flipped the breaker on. And then when we turn back, it flips it off. And then you can see this sliding thing is now in the off position. So that worked out pretty good. Now what we got to do is line up our hole and hope that this square rod is long enough. It looks like we have some adjustability. So you can see basically we need to recreate this hole about right here. But we need to know where to be. I, I could just say, okay, it's centered this way on the door, but then the height I can measure center to center and punch a hole. I also have to move this safety warning up one one label up. This is a pop rivet and a pop rivet gun. You got different uh, nozzles or adapters or tips you can stick on here, on the tip here. And basically the pop rivet gun grabs onto the nail inside and pulls the head of the nail through this metal tube to create a rivet. I like to hold it firm because when it when it pops 
Sometimes the head bounces and scratches stuff around you, or you can also protect the area with tape. And sometimes it takes more than one bite. There we go. And I've shown you guys this a few times. These are real handy. It's a step drill with multiple diameters that you can cut into sheet metal. So we'll put our extension rod back in. Close. Okay, looks like it'll line up. Again, there's a lot of play in these. Now what we're gonna do is punch, using the uh, Greenlee hole punch, or knockout punch, a one and a half inch diameter hole in this panel. So the, the 5 8 hole that we drilled, or approximately 16 millimeter hole, is for the threaded clamp of the Greenlee punch to fit through. So this is our punch, and I think I still have a plug in it from Last time I cut a panel. So as these two come together with sheet metal in between, it, it slices and cuts out a, a plug. So yeah, the cutter, this guy, goes on the outside. And then the corresponding scissor pocket die goes on the inside. And we, we screw the outer die until it's snug against the sheet metal. It's a little tricky to show with the camera. And this, this threaded shaft and nut has a thrust bearing on it and that allows you to apply force without jamming up on the thread too much. And then what we do is we get a socket wrench and we just close these two together until we cut that hole in the panel. Let me get the socket wrench. Okay, so this switch that we're installing has this open slash reset. So if we flip down, then what happens in the back is that this, this latch, this catch here, cams open and allows our knob here to release. So all these have all these crazy little gizmos to keep you safe. So anyway, that's the deal with this.
So this hopper still has some of the white colored polypropylene in it because this, the part on this injection unit is much smaller. So it takes a while to eat through the plastic. It comes out pretty quick. <laughs> and then load the, the color in the second injection unit. There we go. Again with the static thing. All right, the machine knows that the door is open, so you got to tell it all safe. Then we'll turn on the heater, turn on the pump motors. And we are getting there. I already had these warmed up, so it won't take much longer to get to temperature. And then we will start molding. Our new color and our molds here are double shot. Two molds, so four parts can be molded, but right now we're only molding three. I still need to set up temperature measurements for these molds. Again, this is all just like first day run with the new machine, so I'm working out a lot of details. And in fact, I'm gonna close this mold onto this one because I only have heaters on the A side, but this side's a little cool. So if one side of the mold is too hot than the other, then you, the distance between your guide pins grows and then you can get a tight mold close. So let me close this mold. So we'll go to manual mode. The pump is on and uh, I'm gonna double check that we're clear of any obstructions because I don't wanna damage these molds. Then I'm gonna hit um, mold close. And there it goes. I'm not gonna clamp up on it too much, uh, which means that that toggle lever or that toggle plate or swash plate for the toggle clamp would be all the way forward. But even with that, not completely locked up. We've got 19 tons of clamp force on this mold right now. So I'm going to back that off actually because I just want to transmit the heat or keep them equalized. So I'll click that. Now we're at six tons. I'll hit it again. Now we're at one ton force. So let's take it all the way off. Okay, zero tons force, but the mold is still physically in contact and our toggle swash plate is slightly further back. All right, when these temperatures get up to the right point, we will start molding our new color. All right, so we're about four hours into the first run of this molding machine after the service guy came and set it up. So some of the setup here is still temporary, such as the PVC pipe for the cooling system. And I did show how I hooked up the cooling lines to this mold. Uh, what we're doing right now with this, this mold is we're running two molds in parallel and not spinning. So we're not over molding, I'm just running two molds almost like we've got two molding machines running. And the mold over there is a much larger shot size, so it's consuming a lot more heat. And what I'm finding is that the balance of energy for the two cooling systems, which I did have as separate, is not quite right. So this manifold back here, this service is cooling the mold as well as cooling the, the, the uh, hopper chiller uh, for the uh, plastic coming in. It's uh, the cooling jacket for the input plastic to the injection unit. And as it turns out, most of the heat is actually coming through this manifold. And then I, I had it dumping into this bucket of water here with uh, basically just a sump pump. This is like a 1 16th horsepower pump that was pumping water basically from the manifold to the pump and then returning and dumping it right into this bucket. But this wasn't chilled. And I started to basically see uh, steam coming off the top of this of this water. So that indicated to me that I, I, I didn't have things quite right. <laughs> uh, looking at the front of the machine. So this is the heat exchanger for the oil, which basically cools off the hydraulic system in the machine. And it barely needs any cooling at all. And then down under here are the two hydraulic pumps that basically 
are I believe also aided in cooling by the this heat exchanger here. Now you can see the heat exchanger valve is currently on. I've got the machine off right now because I need to update my plumbing. But back here I've got these pipes that go to another kind of kludge little bucket of water. But on this uh, back system I've got this chiller. Uh, this is a one and a half horsepower water chiller which I bought on Amazon and I believe it's sold to chill fish tanks. So it's it was like 700 bucks or 700 US dollars. So it's a pretty low grade chiller, but you know, it works for me. Um, but the thing is, is I had the chiller on the, the water circuit that needed, needed the least amount of chilling. So what I'm gonna do is basically eliminate this back bucket of water and, and pump and everything. And I'm gonna tee off this manifold to this front water circuit. Again, this is all kind of temporary until I build a kind of a whole house water cooling system. But the idea is to basically connect with a T and probably a valve so I can meter the circuits of, of water. Everything back to this back pump and that chiller. So that's what I'm going to do next. And then I'm going to run uh, these two molds for another five or six hours. And... Um, yeah, it's actually working really great other than the overheating of the molds. So this thing's cranking out uh, currently three parts every cycle, so three parts a minute. And we'll talk more about what these molds make and who it's for in uh, probably the next episode. So anyway, so stay tuned and I will update our little plumbing setup and then get back to molding parts. <laughs> oh, one other thing. Uh, with the volume of plastic that this machine uh, consumes, I had to update the way I mix color. So I load uh, polypropylene into these two hoppers. Like for instance, this, this hopper, you can see some of the polypropylene pellets and then this is white color. I'm gonna switch over to a gray color next. And I was basically having trouble keeping up hand mixing color in like uh, basically buckets. <laughs> so I went to Home Depot and I bought this brand new uh, concrete mixer. So you can see in here, basically you turn this thing on with this switch and you can mix, I don't know, 50 pounds of, of color concentrate and, and uh, base resin at a time. You can see that's the remnant. There is a lot of static electricity because this is a plastic barrel, but uh, I can overcome that. So anyway, um, so this is a new addition that I purchased today to help build out our injection molding enhancements for this next level machine that we're uh, that we're hooking up
All right, let's check out our new and improved prototype system here. So we've got the chiller here and a chiller doesn't pump water. It just cools water that flows through it. So you do need an external pump, which is this sump pump right here. Now you can get a recirculating chiller, which has a pump integrated in it, but those cost a little more. And um, for some reason, I don't know why they don't put a pump in these things, but they don't. So I've got the pump here. So our circuit would be the pump pumps water up into our input pipe, which comes along to this, to this T junction. And then I've got a valve here and I can use this valve to adjust the the ratio of cooling water going to the system chiller or heat exchanger this is for the hydraulic oil which actually requires a pretty low amount of heat load so i'm gonna probably make this 45 degrees to start and then the other circuit would be for the heat exchanger or the uh, cooling manifold in the back there so we tee off uh, some portion of the water goes into our machine oil chiller heat exchanger and then that portion goes back to the input to the chiller which gets cooled off and then dumped back into our reservoir where the pump recirculates the other circuit would be uh, where most of the water is going to go is down this this line all the way to the input of our cooling manifold and this thing is used for cooling off like i mentioned the the throat for the injection units to keep the plastic from melting that's these first set of of tubes here which we added and then uh, this is the a side of the mold and then these orange lines go to the rotary table which pop out there and there to this manifold where i've populated to chill the mold through these bolt-on cooling plates with copper pressed into aluminum plate. And yeah, and I had to put those cooling plates on because I couldn't drill cooling lines in this mold because there wasn't any room left. <laughs> and this mold over here probably doesn't need it, but we may add that if need be. So this is our new updated cooling system. So I've abandoned our little pump back there that just couldn't keep up and without a chiller and then i've combined everything into one system and then this is the compressed air for the air eject which i still need to properly hook up or plumb into the machine actually this is temporary until i get the right hose fittings the actual air connection for this machine is right there but it's all metric uh 10 millimeter push to connect tubing and in the u.s i've got three eighths push to connect or a quarter inch which is 9.5 millimeters and it just doesn't go in so i had to hot wire it a bit with my own valve that guy right there with the, of course the quality zip tie anyway i digress <laughs> so let's turn on our new cooling system and see what happens again this is uh, just wedged in pvc pipe i haven't glued anything and i probably won't glue this because ultimately i'm going to build a whole house cooling system for the molding machines up front as well. And I'll try not to drop the GoPro into the reservoir. All this water is kind of funky and nasty because that's that's the the water that was actually in the heat exchanger from where this machine came from. Okay, so we're gonna plug in the pump. I hear the liquid coming. Alright, so we are flowing. So there's a big basically heat exchanger inside of this refrigeration unit here all right so let's fire up the molding machine and i'm going to do another run and see if our molds remain cooler now that we've got this this chiller working so right now it's 82 really 36 it goes that low okay Okay, well, uh, this chiller does take a little bit to figure out that it wants to run. So uh, we'll just wait to, or, well, we're not gonna wait. I'm gonna start molding. All right, let's see how it goes. We'll check back in an hour. <laughs> well, I think that's gonna be a wrap for this week. We definitely got the machine up and running in good condition. 
and our two new molds are running great and definitely an improvement in production throughput. So in the following weeks, we are going to integrate Big Yellow here to pull parts out of this opening of the molding machine automatically. And I'm also going to be adding a automated a plastic conveying and drying system so that I don't have to get up on ladders and dump plastic into the hoppers. And thanks for watching and I'll see you guys later.